Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agassino Zinger. This is episode number two, four, seven, seven, seven. Yes, dos grato seis, dos grato seis. How are you guys doing? How are you feeling? Hope you guys are well hydrated and rested. I'm going to take off this hoodie because I look ridiculous. But yeah, hope you guys are good. How you guys are feeling? Good, good, good. Amazing, amazing, amazing. How am I? I'm feeling pretty nice, actually. I'm pretty, pretty good. Pretty nice. Pretty good. Pretty nice. Pretty good. Just came back from the gym. As per usual, today is my double session. So I'm going to do a gym workout today and then a little five mile run after work, which I'm so excited about. So happy. I'm like Pep Guardiola today. I'm like, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Right. For this five mile run later today. I can't wait for that. Um, but yeah, feeling good, man. Feeling healthy, feeling strong. Um, had a really boring adult weekend where I just stayed in and did absolutely nothing. Um, didn't move an inch. Watched loads of documentaries, watched loads of movies. I watched Dolomite is my name on Netflix, which is amazing. I'll get into that later. I watched also a Nicky Jam documentary, um, tied in with his new album, um, El, Gan- El Ganga Tor, El Ganga Tor, something like that. It's like a really good TV series. I recommend you check it out. It's on Netflix too. I watched the uh, episode nine and ten of Engrenage Spiral, a French cop drama, which is maybe my number one cock drama of all time maybe number two only to the shield i recommend you check that out too and just read loads of books listen to all my audio books that i have um on here um i actually finished um the end is near by dan carlin too of a hardcore history fame which was a very um eye-opening and a bit macabre a bit of a downer book but something that's very very um necessary or needed especially nowadays where people are of the thinking that you know planet earth is just going to keep on existing the way that we know it to exist um until the end of time which isn't true you know civilizations have um risen and fallen you know over the history of time why do we think today's going to be anything different again a bit dark a bit macabre i recommend you check that out too and just generally just trying to keep my mind nice and sharp um but yeah i've been i've been really cool man really chill like i said before i think um the older you get the more you start to realize just how right your parents were about staying in and how it starts to also start to start to understand why your parents are so worried, especially my parents. I grew up in a very religious, very conservative, very strict household where my parents are very much against me going outside. Right. When I used to sneak outside, my parents used to like hide the hoover behind the back of my door. So that when I opened the door, it would kind of fall over and make loads of noise so they can get, wake up, come downstairs, just berate me in the middle of the night, which is, you know, not the most advantageous way to kind of come down off of a couple grams of MDMA. So I don't recommend that as a parent, but I understand why they did it, right? I get it. I get it, man. Um, because the the outside world is dangerous, especially where I live now in Stratford. Um, the rate of homelessness has kind of shot up over the years. I'm not sure why the rate of um, kind of you know drug abuse and just druggies in general on the streets is completely shot up too. You know, the moment it t- the moment it starts to get a bit dark on the streets, all the zombies and all the ghouls start to come out of the woodworks. It's not the most safest area in the world. There's loads of kids hanging around who are up to no good. You know, kids hanging around the street with nothing to do. Um, you just get into trouble because they're bored, which is not you know, beneficial to the general, you know, average, um, everyday working judge just coming back from work, just wants to pop out and go get something for Tesco. It's like, oh, late at night. It's not the best thing in the world. But so I understand now my parents were really bugging out at the time that I was younger um, because it really is dangerous out there. It legitimately is dangerous. And... The other thing about it too is that you really can't, you know, it's hard to have a good night if you don't plan it in advance or you have to be very uh, purposeful and very intentional about the people that you hang out with, ensure that they're fun to hang out with so that you're always going to have a good time, which again is difficult because, you know, you can't necessarily choose your group. Your group chooses you, right? Especially over time, especially the older you get, people move away, people get into relationships, people just lose interest in going out in general and you end up, you know, your, your group ends up shriveling down to maybe a group of maybe five or four when in the past you know i look back at some of my facebook messages especially in the early 2000s and i've got you know tons of people messaging me and talking to me and wanting to be my friend because i was a cool hip connected dude the moment i took a step away and moved away from that trendy part of east london and was purposeful about how i approached my djing career and was kind of moved away to moved away from the scene nights and kind of went more towards the kind of warehouse parties and techno events and house events and just events where you have to pay for money to go in like a ticket event sort of stuff is the moment that friendship group started to die down right so um my friendship group just 
kind of shriveled down just due to just me getting new interests or getting into other things or just my lack of being able to maintain relationships too might affected it but it starts to shrivel so that what ends up happening is that you your nights end up being dictated primarily based on who you're friends with um, which can be a bit you know disconcerting and a bit a bit um, hard to swallow so then you end up just being in a situation where you end up trying to make the best of a bad situation and you end up turning very mundane activities like going to the fucking Weatherspoons into a night out, right? Because you've got nowhere else to go. And now, even though it's a negative, I also see it as a positive. I think now, nowadays, some friends I do have have kind of made it a mission to kind of make sure that they go out with people that they actually like or they actually enjoy the company of, which sounds very counterintuitive. But honestly, believe me, once you're coming up in the scene and you want to make a mark and you want to be a move and shake, you want to be connected, you want to be in the middle of things, it's quite advantageous to just go out and be spontaneous and hang out with whoever you bump into, right? I remember when I used to go out in the scene, I just used to, I just used to hit the strip. I would start at fucking, um, um, I would start at maybe uh, Dragon Bar and work my way up. Maybe go to Jaguar's Shoes maybe pop into another bar up the road from there and then slowly but surely make my way up to the alibi that was kind of the the premise of your night out right um that's what you wanted to do the day in day out um and then you'd hope along the way you'd kind of bump into somebody maybe halfway through halfway up at the haggerson you might bump into some friends and they might then dictate the flow of your night um for the flow of the rest of the flow of the rest of activities that come up happening during the rest of the night right so that might be how it went but the older you get the more you're you're not able to do that or the more you don't want to do that because you start to bump into some very questionable characters, people you don't necessarily like or want to spend any time with. So you have to be very purposeful about who you spend your time with. And that can be, like I said, it's very hard to do so when you're older. It's just hard to make friends. Um, so you end up tend to just staying in. You end up tend to you end up enjoying your nights in, right? You get to catch up on stuff that you wouldn't catch up on time with. You end up just, you know, especially with your smartphone, you just waste time pretending you're outside by living through other people's stories and shit. It just other ways to kind of go about that sort of stuff um but i've kind of always been in that way anyway but i've just kind of thought about it now more so uh, just thinking how right my parents were about staying in and yeah i have to say staying in is very 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 underrated i think so i think more people need to do that i think more people need to do that so they can appreciate when they do go out too because i think that is also one something that makes you get a little bit desensitized about good nights out because you're always outside so you, you end up not appreciating just how fun it is to go out to a club night or to go out to a busy bar and have a dance because you're always going to busy bars and having dances. Sometimes denying yourself that luxury the same way how, you know, you deny yourself some treats and then you kind of hold back so that you can kind of appreciate it later is very advantageous. So you can kind of build a tolerance level up again. Um, but again, I'm probably speaking to the choir about this, but I've just something I've kind of come to realization of, especially in the last few years, I've kind of been more purposeful about the, the things I'm going out to, making sure that I'm trying to maybe only go out to kind of the big events with the bigger DJs, especially if it's a DJ thing that I'm kind of going out under the impression that I want to see somebody play. I want to get some market research and see how people react to the people's music, how this person carries himself, and just generally just be about the scene. You can do that without it being like a big you know the last this is the best party in the world project x type of thing you can just do it and just kind of enjoy it and then kind of keep it moving go home um but yeah it's been a pretty cool weekend pretty mellow next weekend is probably the same and then i think the week after that is probably when i do go out but yeah so far so good man it's made fasting and working out really easy too you don't really have much to recover from apart from your workouts it's not the added um struggle of trying to recover from a hangover or whatever it may be or a come down you just pretty chill pretty cool and again i think this was this was the intention um or the or the kind of yeah this is what the end result that i wanted for sober october i wanted it to be a reset of my everyday how i kind of carry myself in general i wanted to kind of recalibrate how i kind of go about going out how i go about conducting myself you know what i mean this is what i wanted it to be and it's essentially worked out in that regard so i'm very happy with that going forward anyway lots of topics to go through no point wasting time now um because you know we've got to do this now because this is the only time we've got to do this i guess <laughs> yeah so i've got loads of topics on the internet i've saved throughout the week i'm going to go through them uh, systematically one by one if you're listening via the podcast app if you want to support the show please leave me a five-star review at the end of it i'll go a long way to help people you know discover it and kind of get to grips with it um if you're listening via or watching via the youtube app why not leave me a thumbs up um leave me a comment let me know what you think of the show 
And of course, subscribe if you like it and you want to tune in for some more, innit? Why the fuck not? Let's move this a little bit here. Yep, so let's get into some show. Let's get into see what I'm talking about. Let's move this a little bit there. Let's always talk about it. Let's go. So, number one topic, hot, hot off the press, is news that Drake, Drake, the biggest star in hip hop at the moment, right? One of our number one artists got booed off a stage, right? Something you probably never hear, right? Drake getting booed off a stage, but it happened. It happened. It happened um, this weekend or this, this past weekend at Camp Flogna, which I'm sure most of you guys are aware of. This is um, Tyler the Creator's um, yearly festival that he's been doing. I think it's 2016. Um, Tyler the Creator is a very interesting character in hip hop because he's essentially came in, kind of broke down the doors and really carved his own lane. And did it in a way where he didn't have to fuck with anybody. He didn't have to have a gatekeeper. He didn't have to have a co-sign. He didn't have to collaborate with the biggest artists in the world in order to kind of get a look. He kind of did his things very purposefully and very intentionally. Told us that he didn't fuck with anybody and that he's going to do things the way he wanted to do. And so far, he's been kind of proved right. He's been, you know, every album's got, you know, more more and more critical reception. So far, the previous, well, the, the most recent album has been his, probably his most successful in terms of sales, in terms of position in the charts in terms of critical review in terms of fan reception he's also been able to build on top of that with these other businesses outside of it where it comes to sneakers his whole collection with golf um, and just generally jewelry furniture video directing he's doing a little bit of script writing got got, no, got a comedy show recently got picked up so he's, he's got his finger in different sort of pies but musically we don't really get a lot of variation from tyler because he produces mix masters and does his own music um, he doesn't necessarily collaborate with a lot of people so i think the festival acts as his way to kind of let us into his let is a living personification of his itunes playlist right we get to hear and see the kind of things that tyler creator is interested in outside of his own stuff that he does and if you're familiar with tyler creator you'll know that he's a big lover of music right just need to watch on your cover of his nardwa interviews to know that he's you know he's got you know um savant level memorization um skills picking out albums and particular song titles and album placements and producer credits and writer credits he's a real big music nerd right so the festival is a great way for fans um you know all over the country all over the world to kind of fully immerse themselves in everything that's to do with tyler creator old future golf wang and all that stuff right and usually they announce the lineup you know ahead of time they kind of it's actually one of the rare hip-hop or artist-led festivals that actually feels like a festival they actually book loads of different types of artists a whole breadth of people there's loads of on-site entertainment ferris wheel arcade games photo booths loads of real cool interesting stuff that makes you feel like it's actual festival of course you can't camp there there's no on-site camping or accommodation but when I went there in 2017, I stayed in the, I think is it called the Generator Hostel in West Hollywood. That was really nice. And I kind of ventured out there when I was doing there during the weekend. But it was a very good, cool event. I fucking enjoyed it. I loved it, every minute of it, right? So it's a very cool festival. But usually they just announce the festival. They announce the lineup ahead of time so everyone knows who's performing. This time, I think, was the only time in the festival's history where they didn't announce a co-main headliner. I've got the flyers up here on the list. So I'm going to show you. So I think this is the maybe the lineup from 2016, right? As you can see, all the all the lineup, um, all the artists are mentioned on there. Um, I think 2017, the same thing happened too. 2018, last year, 2022, they announced every single artist. Kids See Ghost was obviously a big look for Tyler Crater last year, especially after the album came out. And then this year. The co made the co made the co main headliner wasn't announced, right? So you've got Tyler Creator's name there, and then next week you've got a banner with question marks on it. Now the conversation on the interwebs kind of to justify this Drake booing was that the rumor around the interwebs was that Frank Ocean was meant to perform. Now, if you're familiar with Frank Ocean and you're a fan of Frank or so you're a fan of Tyler, you would know that Frank Ocean is notoriously inconsistent with these performances. There's no rhyme or reason why he decides not to turn up the particular gig. In the same vein that why Lutu Uzi Vert, Playboy Carti, and some of these other people are notoriously no notoriously don't show up to parties or don't show up to events that they're booked at. We don't know. And for some reason, I don't know why it is with these some some of these high level artists or artists in general, they either never explain why they don't turn up or they just give you some cookie cutter lie about feeling unwell or about you know production issues or family problem or something, right? They just give you some sort of like 
you know, um, copy and paste reply that meant to appease the fans. But if anything, just generates more questions rather than answers. It's very rare that an artist will come out and specifically say, hey, like legitimately, we're trying to get this particular stage design in. It didn't come in on time and I can't do the show without this. So I have to make sure it shows a particular experience. I don't know, whatever. It's very difficult to get a very straight answer from these artists. They don't necessarily like to give explanation to, to, their, to their fans, which is very annoying in that respect, right? So if you know anything about Frank, you also know that he doesn't turn up to shows, right? Um, I specifically went to go, I specifically went, or we specifically went to Primavera in 2016, I think that might have been. Um, 2016, 2018? I forgot that year that was. We specifically went to Primavera to see Frank Ocean perform, right? And he didn't turn up. And he didn't turn up to a whole slew of um, European festival days. I think this was in a run-up or post, this is during the whole blonde uh, rollout, right? Um, he didn't show up to loads of festivals in Europe during that time. I think he only performed at maybe one. Maybe it was Copenhagen. Maybe it was a Love Box. A Love Park. Is it Love Box? Maybe it might have been Love Box. One of the festivals, only when he turned up to. He didn't turn up to a lot of festivals. And it all got cancelled last minute. And if you know anything about promoting, or you, if, if you've ever put on your own club night, which is, you know, super easy to do, you, you know, go to a well-known club, you ask them to put on a club night, you might split the door or split the bar. And then, you know, you keep it moving, right? um you come in plug in your system or plug in a usb and you put on a party but you know that even to do a good successful club night you need some kind of you know run up some sort of um marketing idea or marketing plan you need to be able to promote and advertise your party maybe a couple of weeks or maybe a few weeks ahead of time right just to drum just to build up some anticipation so if you kind of extrapolate that and kind of you know 10 times that by a thousand whatever right then you know that a festival they plan those things way in advance, maybe a year in advance. They have the artist locked down way ahead of time too because, you know, the politics involved in getting people to assert, to maybe turn up, maybe to make sure you're in per people's um, uh, list of priorities, to make sure that they kind of have that date free ahead of time in case something else turns up. You have to make sure you're moving quickly to get the artists that you want, even because they're going to be in demand. Right? If you're tired of create, it's probably going to be the people that you want to perform are probably going to want to perform other places too, right? So for it to for for anyone to believe that just suddenly now he didn't decide not to come is just insane. They probably knew this way ahead of time, right? They probably didn't knew maybe a week ahead of time that Frank Ocean probably wasn't going to turn up. This is only if the Frank Ocean rumor is true. I don't know if it's true. Maybe it was completely false, and maybe Tyler would argue that no, Frank Ocean was never meant to turn up anyway. It was always meant to be like a roller, uh, a kind of um, a rolling uh, cast of special guests performing, coming out, popping in, popping out. Maybe that was the whole point of it. We don't know. But we're never going to know that because the show was cut short because effectively Drake got booed on stage. So he comes out on stage. I've got the video here, right? He comes out on stage and essentially, um, I think he, I think what essentially happens was that the the first special guest was Uzi, then I think ASAP Rocky, and then Tyler comes out and says, I've got some more friends and then brings out Drake. Drake starts performing and instantly people start booing and reacting negatively because I think they were under the impression that the person after ASAP Rocky and Uzi was going to be Frank Ocean. So they were very much looking forward to it and it wasn't, it was Drake. And you could also argue that maybe in their defense that, you know, that sort of crowd, you know, they would argue that, hey, we have to hear Drake all the time. He's always performing somewhere in, in North America, right? There's, you know, there's no shortage. You're never going to miss Drake. He always performs somewhere big once a year. If not, his own tour gift appearing somewhere else you know performing at a club performing at a fest you're always going to be able to see drake sometime in the year right you can you can maybe make a plan to see him so those fans could probably argue that hey we don't want to hear the one time we don't want to hear drake is that camp vlog now we want to hear all that um as dj kelly said all that weirdo music all the alternative all the indie stuff all the kind of slightly underground stuff all the stuff that you would never hear played in a nightclub we want to hear that now right we don't want to be it, it to be kind of infiltrated by hearing a commercial you know mainstream hip-hop act like like a drake is but also on the south side of me is like saying imagine if you paid the money to go see uh can vlog now festival right and you get to see all these amazing people what's the list of, of artists look at that list right you've got daisy you've got nakel smith slow tire radiant child radiant children sorry juno clyro summer walker one of the best albums out this year thundercat willow smith domo genesis idk the internet fk twigs gold link taco dominic fike um solange yg brockhampton tyler himself juice world her daniel caesar 21 savage blood orange the baby or sweatshirt yes in bay imagine seeing all those people and then getting drake on top and then still booing does that not prove how entitled and spoiled some fans are it's insane isn't it i'll play the video now for you guys to hear it but this is essentially what happened. 
You know, oh I'm going to tell you. Please. Like I said, I'm here for you tonight. If you want to keep going, no. I will keep going tonight. What's up? No. Frank. If you want to keep going, I will keep going tonight. No. He's going to stay. It's been love. I love y'all. I go by the name of Drake. Thank you for having me. And he probably did it for the love too. That's a that's a real sad part. That's why I feel super embarrassed and super sad for Tyler. Tyler's made it known that he's a big fan of Drake. Probably it was a, an amazing look for him to get Drake to perform there. Maybe he probably couldn't announce it. Let's work out. Let's work out some fear. Let's be a little bit more educated, a little bit more nuanced as a fans, and not just kind of react knee jerkly because we didn't get the person we wanted to perform. But let's say. The reason why Tyler couldn't announce Drake was performing was because, you know, he did it for the love and did it for the look. It was probably like a one-to-one, -one, a one-on-one -on -one kind of, hey, um, I slid into Drake's DM, said, hey, do you want to perform my thing? He said yes, and he came down, right? And usually those kind of events, if you've put on any kind of night, I know I have before in the past, I've booked some maybe some high-profile artists, sometimes they'll do it for the love, but they'll tell you not to promote their name so that the agent doesn't find out that they played somewhere for free, right? Or they play somewhere for, you know, some cash in hand money, right? So you don't promote it, you don't say nothing, you just keep it on the low key. That's what that's what people do. So maybe that was part of it, right? They did some sort of like, you know, some friend friend to friend, favor for favor for favor sort of deal. And Drake showed up for the love and essentially did it just for the love. He could be out there doing many other things, but he came down. Or maybe he was just there to have a good time at Tyler Creator's show because he happens to be in LA and he lives there. And he happened to just pass by and then, you know, Drake was Tyler was like, Hey, do you want to perform? He said, Yeah, why not? So if it's for for you to then decide to boo a person who just turned up just for the love. It's quite disgusting. And even if he turned up as a scheduled guest, it also just says a lot about fans that they would boo somebody that consistently performs at a high level in Drake, who's, of, who's always putting on a good show, who consistently goes out there and supports up and coming artists, people that are lower than him on a totem pole. He's up there in the, in the, you know, in the heavens, way up above the skies, on his, on his mountain top, right? But he's always extending his hand down and always trying to lift people up and give people a platform. You know, look at the stuff he's done for the UK scene, you know? Loads of UK rappers have a lot to thank Drake for in terms of what he's done for their career. So there's a lot of good will he has um, amongst artists and peers. So it's obvious, it's, you'd understand why someone like a Tyler would be very appreciative of him. So for, but then fans would rather boo him because they wanted to see Frank Ocean, who's notoriously inconsistent. It's notoriously... He's notoriously known for consistently not turning up. Now, we're not sure if it's actually Frank Ocean that was meant to perform there, but that's what the rumors on the internet say. And if that is the case, he doesn't turn up for loads of stuff. The only stuff he's been able consistently to turn up to lately, as of late, has been his club night in, in New York, right? But there's obviously a very personal tie he has towards of it, especially when it comes to dealing with um, AIDS prevention and, you know, um, maybe giving a voice to the LGBTQ plus community. Something that's obviously close to his heart. He's obviously taken a lot of interest to it, but... He's consistently not turned up to a lot of shows. But that's the one thing he has turned up to, his own event. So, and if he's not going to turn up to his show for, you know, imagine somebody who's a close collaborator of his, a close friend, I'd assume. It just goes to show just how much lack of respect Frank Ocean has for his fans, right? He's done that before. Like, again, that whole tour that he did in Europe that he missed the Premier Festival for, we didn't really get a straight answer as to why he didn't turn up. Do you actually think suddenly, the week before the event, production issues would cause him not to show up to a show? Most of these people, most especially the newer generation of hip-hop acts, they just decide not to turn up because they know they can get away with it because their fans are blinkered, they're annoying, they have no sense of, I don't know. They don't, they, they don't, it doesn't, annoy, it doesn't annoy them as much as it should do. Like Uzi, Uzi doesn't turn up to loads of shows, but he, he still has a whole gaggle of fans running after him wherever he appears somewhere, right? doesn't make any sense. No one's really holding his feet to the fire about why he doesn't just show up to a show. He just decides, I'm not going to go. I just, I commit to it, but I'm not going to go. Imagine the amount of people that you're disappointing when it comes to the promoter's end, when it comes to the people that are attending the festival. It, and again, the whole Primavera, there's a very much a, a quite a little drab feel. Everyone we bumped into that were walking around was really bummed out that Frank Ocean wasn't going to appear, right? We really did get our hopes up and think Frank Ocean was going to turn up, but he didn't show up. I can't even imagine what it must have been like for the kids out at the Camp Vlognar Festival, right? But that still isn't justification for booing Drake. Again, let's compare the both of them. One is very much in tune to what his audience wants and is consistently delivering and over-delivering. Another one in Frank Ocean is consistently pushing his fans to the brink of like having to question whether or not they want to be his fan or not, right? The last few singles that we heard from his new project have been pretty, you know, pretty god-awful. Um, he consistently refuses to use drums in his new songs, as Joe Budden likes to point out, right? He consistently trying to push his audience to accept a different 
um, type of music that he's making now. He's not necessarily going back to making anything that we heard previously from Channel Orange on Nostalgia Ultra. It's all new stuff sonically that we're not very much used to from hearing from Frank. Again, you know, we're the big fans of it, so you're going to trust his, trust his uh, musical direction, just kind of ride or die with him. But he's consistently pushing his fans, really probing them, poking them, not turning up for shows or pulling in lackluster performances. And then that's the person that you want to boo in support of. It's like, does that make any sense? And again, you just feel really embarrassed for Tyler the Creator again because this was probably a really big look for him. And you can even see from this video here just how bummed out he, he looks about this whole situation. Um, with a bit, there's a video here I've got where he's super, you can tell he's super, super bummed out about it. Whereas this one here, he says he wants to bring, oh, do you want me to bring out another guest? And then people are like still saying boo and all that sort of nonsense. Look at him. All right, look. He sounds a bit down and a bit and a bit again. I'm not sure. I really because appreciate because I think Drake came out twice. I think that's what set the crowd off and made them go a bit crazy. And again, in defense of the crowd, anyway, let's just talk about the crowd. In defense of them, maybe it was Tyler's fault for not announcing that Drake was performing. Maybe they could have just announced Drake and then put the, the question mark banner and had somebody else, perf and then that could have filled in. That could have then left the space open for Frank to perform. And if he didn't perform, you still would have had Uzi and Rocky. So you couldn't be... <coughs> so Tyler couldn't be blamed for misdirecting his fans. But I think maybe allowing the rumor mill to persist that Frank was going to turn up and not shutting down those rumors maybe built up a false sense of expectation. And then, of course, people at that show who are very much hardcore, Odd Future, Camp Flognar, um, Golf Wang fans were obviously going to freak out. But I never would have. Again, I think this just this just shows the difference in appreciation of fans in the US and the Europe. I think fans in the US are generally, by and large, quite spoiled in terms of who they get to see in North America. You get to see basically everybody perform at least once a year, so you you, you know you don't necessarily appreciate as much. And I think also the special guest unannounced person thing in in America. Get people are very entitled to it too. Like you see a lot of people on social media demanding people, certain people can perform. There's not much, that, you know. Whereas in you in Europe, or especially when people come to tour here, especially in London, you get a lot of people I see on social media saying, "Oh, they hope to see certain so and so perform or come out and do a special guest appearance." They're hoping, 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 as opposed to saying, oh, "I want him, I want her." And then generally, I think as well, we have this sense of appreciation where like most of the people in the UK, that's why I think the whole special lineup and not announcing set list in the UK doesn't really work too well here. And people get really annoyed. I know I get frustrated when, especially in club nights, we don't put the set list up because we generally tend to make, I know my friends or people that I'm friends with in the scene, especially electronic music scene, we tend to decide to buy tickets based on the club promoter, the, the, the people that put it on the party, right? Or based on the lineup, we will just or if it's a venue, for instance, right? You're just gonna buy the ticket and go. So you don't need any sense of false anticipation or build up or secret guests to kind of sell tickets because I'm gonna buy the ticket regardless if it's fold or if it's a particular party promoter, right? Um, Origins or something, or if particular DJs that I play, I'm just gonna go. And, if it's mostly drum ensemble playing, I'm gonna see him play. I don't care who else is playing. I'm just gonna buy a ticket and see him MCDE play. Point blank, period. And whoever happens to play as a special guest, it's just a bonus on top of the, it's just a bonus on top of the it's just a cherry on top of the cake. But I think in the US, they really they they have this sense of entitlement as if the money that they paid to go and see all these people play also um, entitles them to demand that they get a certain type of special guest to come and perform, which is insane because you look at this you look at the list of people that are performing at this year's uh, Camp Vlog now, right? And I got the the fly up here on the on the screen. And that set list, right? Just the middle people here, the ones that are kind of like a bit bigger font: Solange, YG, Brockhampton, Tyler himself, Juice World, her, and Daniel Caesar. That's already worth way worth your cost of admission. Each person there performing is already a thirty twenty dollar to maybe fifty dollar ticket anyway. So you're getting your money back and some. You're getting the other advantages of it being a daytime festival, a longer period of time to hear more music. You get to meet like-minded people, a festival environment, Ferris wheel, arcade games, and pictures and all that sort of shit. It's a great time. So it doesn't really matter who comes out, really. You're always going to get your money's worth. So for it to be someone like a Drake, who's one of the high-ticket you know, artists on the list, somebody that's going to command a, a, a ticket fee of you know $100 and plus, including booking fee and all that sort of plus booking fee, to boo is just like, it's just absolutely insane. But again, like I was showing, it just goes to show just why 
someone like a, a, a Tyler can be such a cunt to his fans or why it appears that he's like that sometimes to his fans because fans can be super annoying. You know, sometimes he says like, you know, in interviews he said loads of times, you know, he wants his fans to approach him in a certain way and they can't take pictures of him driving his car because he doesn't want weirdos to come and start tracing his number plate and start following him around the country. Um, he doesn't want people to come up to him when he's eating. Like, he's got a very particular way about how he wants his fans to interact with him. Obviously, it's too late now because, you know, I think all the crazy antics in the beginning of Tyler's career, career especially with the old Future Times, it has essentially garnered a particular group of people to, has, has attracted a particular group of people towards him who haven't necessarily aged as well as he has over the years so he can't necessarily control that anymore but you get to see why some artists do hate their fans you understand why now isn't it? and I, I kind of understood it a lot more especially when i got really involved very much interested in the comedy circuit and following a lot of the comedy podcasts i heard a lot of comedians say sometimes they, they, they can reach a point where you have a joke that works really well but it tends to attract the wrong kind of the audience that you don't necessarily want and it can be a very um, challenging pivot to somehow distance yourself from that joke to not so, so you don't have all these chodes or all these bros or all these particular kind of political leaning people coming into your show because they like that particular joke you did. That, but you know that doesn't necessarily represent you as a person. Same with an artist, right? Like you're, if you're an artist and you've been putting out loads of amazing material and the one hit that blows up happens to be a song that you fucking detest, like it's, it's hard to then try and pivot and move away from that because the fans that you've gained off of that song aren't necessarily the fans that you'd actually wanted in the first place and, and maybe aren't necessarily fans of you they're just fans of that particular song so it can be a very weird it can, very weird um balance to make and i think maybe that's where tyler is at at the moment um he's suddenly now maybe at the point now he's he can honestly say he's maybe aged out his fans he's maybe matured beyond where they have at that point in period because again i don't know maybe i would be disappointed if drake came out i might have been bummed oh, man, i feel fully frank ocean but i wouldn't boo do you know what i mean i would not boo like that's something i wouldn't do because that's still an amazing person to see on the stage it's not like you're seeing fucking you know megan trainer or someone do you know what i mean it's fucking drake it's still performing it's fucking it's insane it really is insane how they will do that but again i go to show how spoiled some fans are and you can only assume how bummed out and how annoyed uh, tyler must be and also imagine what it must feel like for drake in this era or especially now it probably he can probably he probably can't remember the last time he got booed right or the last time he had a no show an event it never probably happens right he can probably announce uh, an event now right in 24 hours and you know 24 hour turn of time and I'm, I'm pretty sure he'd pack out most five seater venues right for them maybe even ten thousand seater venues so to get booed somewhere especially in front of a crowd like that right a crowd that he probably thinks is probably you know above above in some way shape or form maybe a little bit is really really a big slap in the face but also maybe a good humbling moment or maybe a good moment for drake to be like you know what maybe i'm overexposed maybe he needs to go back maybe he needs to take lessons a lesson out of the book of, you know, the Beyonce's and the Rihanna's who have a, a real uncanny ability to kind of completely back away and regress from media and then pop out just when you don't least expect it, right? I think Beyonce is kind of the master of that, right? Um, being in your face 24-7 and then kind of pulling away. Um, maybe Drake has to kind of maybe do that now. Maybe it's an indication. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a one-off situation where you happen to be in front of a rabid fan base who want to hear a particular kind of music and the last thing they want to hear is you, right? Maybe that's it's just an isolated situation but again man everyone involved should be embarrassed um booing a drake at comfort not just makes absolutely no sense but again fans are within their right to do it maybe because you know they pay their money you can do what they want but jesus christ man what an what a real 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 unfortunate situation for everybody involved but yeah check it out if you want to um i think next year's one will probably be better again going forward i'm interested to hear what the drake bar would be regarding this on his new album you're definitely going to hear him say something about this and again, I'm interested to see what Tyler says about this as well, whether or not he'll come out and make a comment, whether or not he'll actually um, knock it on the head and kind of have a bit of a pause and take um, and kind of stop doing it next year. I don't know, but I really can really check it out. It's probably one of my favorite um, artist-led festivals out there at the moment. Really eclectic lineup and just generally well, very, very well put together. Um, but it's a shame that some fans are very um, spoiled and unappreciative. But what can you do? Next on the list here, what do we have? What do we have? Oh, really good interview with Kanye, actually. Kanye's, um, Kanye's been a, on a bit of a tear, right? Can we say that right as about now from the whole Jesus King album promotion? Um, I think this is probably his best interview so far. I had this theory that Kanye gives better... His best interviews usually come around... 
his best interviews are when he's been interviewed in front of a creative design-led entrepreneurial audience when he's basically being interviewed by quote-unquote white people he gives his best interviews i think when he's on those hip-hop stations or radio shows or podcasts they're always very fractious because there's always an underlying element of him trying to prove his blackness um loads of hip-hop card conversations happening or questions um, he always feels like he's having his back against the wall especially with the whole trump um, support over the last few years they're very combative right they're not they don't make for good interviews which is probably why he he likes to do the same low interviews of course there's probably some payola involved there where someone's getting paid some money there's probably some deal there behind the scenes with def jam we don't know with apple who knows allegedly but there's reason why he probably likes to do say low interview because you know you know he's not going to get much pushback it's going to be pretty um you know pretty um plain sailing um but if you want to hear Kanye talk you know that really cool motivational inspirational design um talk then your best bet is to really see him talk in front of a panel especially when it comes to design an award show um whatever it may be those are where you're going to really get the best out of Kanye right and um you don't really see Kanye on panel discussions too often in it really I wonder why maybe that's a purposeful thing He's very particular about who he sits next to. But this panel discussion or this this interview was with Fast Company. He sat alongside Steve Stephen Smith, who was responsible for designing the Yeezy Seven Hundred, um, the original one, the Wave Runner, uh, the original Dad Shoe. He also comes from New Balance and done loads of stuff with them. Some stuff with Puma and Reebok. He's got a really long, his, storied history in sneaker design. But the interesting part about this whole interview is twofold. I think one is that we saw the debut of the Clog that we saw Kanye or I think his kids debut a few a few weeks ago. Now it's kind of been updated a bit. I think there's a lot a lot more added detail in it. It's all one unit. I think it's made. I think it's all one unit. Maybe it might be um, two pieces. I'm not too sure. Um, it's made out of a combination of EVA. So very interesting to see what that kind of feels like. I'm interested to see how it's going to be. Um, in, I'm interested to see how that's going to be. Um, received by the sneaker public because in my experience again let me see if i can find it uh yeezy clog right in my experience especially these days with the sneakerheads i think some sneakers are quite they're, they're not the most ad, ad, adventurous buyers or trainers out there they're very much stuck in their ways and don't necessarily try to wear new things um i think if this was back in the day of old sneakers i think we'd be all over this and we'd be very much down for it but i'm not sure if people are going to be down for it as much as i am but i thought the clog was very much an interesting shoe that they debuted here as you can see um full of uh, loads of perforation i think this is the first time we saw the clog was when northwest was wearing it right and now we see an updated version of it loads of interesting perforations and it comes together really well you know it kind of reminds me it reminds me of a little bit of a, of a zaha a zaha hadid architecture Let's see if i can find it right architectural building so Zaha Hadid, let's see, right? It kind of looks similar to that. Loads of really cool swoops and curves and different sort of perforations. It kind of reminds you a little bit of some uh, a building Zaha Hadid with, 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 with a design. What do you think? I think it looks a little bit like that. Pretty pretty similar to it, no? So loads of the deep buildings. So that's what the clog looks like. Um, again, reception wise, I'm interested to see what it looks like because how it gets received by sneakers because it reminds me a little bit of the Air Mock, which is a really um, influential um, niche underground sort of appreciated nike a a a um a a a a c g shoe from back in the day <laughs> fucking no man um a c g mock one of my favorite shoes um i think it's kind of styled uh, from uh, i think it's from a potato the inspiration it came from from potato the artist kind of from what he said it so it kind of reminds me of similar of this sort of shoe which again wasn't that well received i think it got retro two or three times by nike um every time it got retro they never really sold that well i remember when i used to work at 1948 like we had loads of these pairs lying around i was able to get i was able to double up on a few of them i sold a couple of them because they didn't fit too right but again one of my more favorite shoes i think it was kind of a most of a mountain climbing shoe a hiking shoe but something very very interesting that i would like to add to my collection again something very much different from what you'd seen in more people's collections but i'm not sure people are going to be into them as much as i am into them but I'm interested to see how they how they get received going forward. The air, the clog, sorry, where are they? Where's the clog? There you go. There, this clog there. I'm interested to see how it gets received. So that's a very interesting part of the interview. They're talking about how he's putting it together, the inspiration behind it, and I think this is the next kind of uh, marquee product that they're going to put a lot of money towards out there. And again, we're interested to see how it gets received. Do do we see a lot of people in the restaurant industry, a lot of people working within the medical field, replace their clogs that they usually wear their crocs to wear something like this let's see wait wait and see if that is the case what how they're going to be priced that'll be just two what, what's the soul is the soul the 700 soul similar a bit with the holes in it so yeah that goes as well 
But another part of the interview that was very interesting that I thought was probably the most interesting part of the interview was Kanye essentially revealed um, what went into, what kind of led to his breakdown and why the whole Virgil, the Virgil friendship broke down and was resurrected and kind of was a bit fractious for a while. I think for the most, for most um, geeks and nerds of streetwear or of the culture in general, I think we were aware, even from the outside looking in, that there was some kind of tension between them, right, in Virgil and Kanye. I think we saw a lot of tension and a lot of a splintering of groups when Kanye started going on these Trump rants and started, you know, acting as if Trump was his stepdad and shit. We saw a real big shift. And I think that was easy, evident or easy to kind of guess because a lot of the people that Kanye used to hang around with, a lot of his creative collaborators are very politically active. They're very socially conscious um, um, and they make their point known, right, about how much they despise the current president of the United States. So for Kanye to go out there on the limb and specifically, you know, declare his love for, for Trump, you knew it was going to rub people out the wrong way. And we've kind of seen it so far, right? We haven't seen Kanye pictured with Don C ever since. We haven't really seen him pictured with John Legend, with IBM Jasper, with a few other people in his creative group. He's kind of built up or cultivated a whole new group of people now, right? Most of the kids around him are pretty young, right? Because they still look at him like a, an absolute beast, uh, a creative beast that he is, right? He's a real um, outlier. He's a real unicorn in terms of being able to do exactly what he wants, when he wants, which is why you see people like Ace Rock and Tyler Creator still next to him and still supporting what he does because they can kind of separate the politics with the artist, right? And kind of see that by and large, he's been able to amass a great fortune doing exactly what he wants, not listening to anybody and really kind of carving his own way. And he's kind of finally reached a point where he's got fuck you money, is able to do exactly what he wants, which is probably what uh, Kanye and which is what I, Ace of Rocky and Tyler Cray are probably aspiring to do in the end. So you can see where that love and appreciation comes from. But his old school friends are kind of nowhere to be seen. And it kind of got you thinking, right? Um, that's probably why we kind of got the feeling, you know, a lot of it would probably stem around, you know, what happened within the, the within his kind of um, inception of the, from the time he debuted on Paris Fashion Week with that, you know, um, ridiculed um, Paris Fashion Week debut that he did out of the blue to the time that he finally launched Yeezy to all the kind of twos and throws behind production and kind of rants and raving, all that sort of stuff. We kind of felt that there was something brewing in the background, but we didn't know it was this deep. And Kanye basically um, explains exactly why he got to a point of, you know, ending up in a mental institute. And this is kind of a clip from the show now. I'm going to play for you, but I'll link the whole interview in the show notes for you guys to check out yourself. This is Kanye There's talking. no way. The first Adidas collection came out and there were lineups around the store. Then the second collection that we did, no lineups, no store, no backer. I told Adidas that Elvin made, I said, hey Adidas, I'm gonna marry Giselle. I know we just went on prom. I came back, hey Giselle, dump me. Uh, would you, uh, you still wanna? And we remember this, right? I remember those rumors. Remember that happened, I think that's after Yeezy season one, we realized, or maybe it's season two, that was like, oh, they came out with a statement like, oh, the deal was only a one or two season deal. And now Kanye is going to move his production to LVMH or somebody else. I, think, I don't think it was specified yet who it was going to be. Um, or maybe that was a splinter. I think there was maybe the rumors, there was maybe those rumors about um, the production of the shoes going to move to somebody else. Or maybe Adidas was still going to do the shoes and Kanye was going to do the clothing with somebody else. Maybe I forgot what it was. But it was during the time when Kanye was letting it be known that in order to kind of be a, a, a level, a, I think the example they used was Stella McCartney. In order to produce clothing of Stella McCartney's level, you have to have the backing of the big uh, fashion groups, right? Which is why Stella McCartney eventually ended up re-signing back to think with LVMH recently, right? You need to have their ability to kind of press the button for you to have access to all the production, to all the manufacturing, um, all the distribution to kind of get your product at that level. There is no way you can do it on your own by the most part. You, you can do it on your own to a certain level, but to really permeate culture and to really be, to scale it and to become a billion dollar company, um, but in terms of ter especially in terms of popularity, especially in terms of exposure, in terms of availability, you have to be able to kind of marry up with these big um, fashion houses and big corporations. Uh, you still wanna, <laughs> so, um, so the second collection, there's no, no Yeezy. The third collection, now I'm investing. I can't put Atelier together. You, get, you can't imagine how hard it is to get four amazing pattern cutters in the same room. And that's exactly what goes back to what I said before. Remember I said, <coughs> I think there's a real danger that some of these kids coming up nowadays are too infatuated with being the person in front of the camera or having the marquee job 
like fashion director, creative director, stylist, photographer. Whereas the real need in the industry or the real gaps or the real areas where you can kind of really penetrate and kind of make a move and really make a mark and really make an impact and really make yourself indispensable uh, when you try and actually learn a craft or try and do the job that are the day-to-day -day jobs that kind of are the underpinnings of this whole industry in fashion. And one of them is pattern cutting. If you, instead of going out there and trying to study fashion communication or those wafty, airy-fairy degrees, why not go out there and study pattern cutting in a very nondescript university, right? Obviously, someone with, you know, some sort of cachet and some sort of name with it, but it doesn't need to be the University of the Arts. It can be wherever, it can be whatever university that is out there, but actually learning how to actually pattern cut and actually going out there in the workplace and doing it for random brands like Zara or Inditex or whatever it may be. And then kind of working way up through the fashion um, hierarchy and ladder and kind of exposing some different designers. That will then that will then involve you. You will be front and center of the scene. You'll be in and amongst it. You'll be indispensable. People will wonder you from all over the place, right? And if you look at every... Have you ever seen fashion documentaries and seen the people that actually work in ateliers? Who they, who they happen to be? They're usually older ladies, right? People that look like your mums. Who are working our mums right they're working in these kind of places usually because there's no knowledge transfer the kids coming up nowadays aren't necessarily going for those kind of courses so there's no one for those women to go and kind of you know take under their wing and act as an apprentice and kind of bestow the knowledge on so these women are kind of you know working and until their fingers bleed you know until the ripe old ages of wherever it may be getting paid very well don't get me wrong but you know that knowledge is them being lost when these people move away or pass away Whereas if kids are coming up nowadays and are instead of trying to focus on being the one percenter and being the kind of person at the end of the runway, why not try and be the person behind the scenes who's making sure that that show runs on time, who's casting, who is, um, I don't know, just managing the artists themselves or the designer and making sure the schedule is where it needs to be. Those are very much important places of very much, very, very important um, aspects of the industry that are very much overlooked by the kids coming up nowadays. I hope going forward, kids see nowadays that, you know, if you want to be involved, really, get a real job in the scene. You don't need to be these, you know, these kind of surface level things that make you look successful. But by and large, you know, you don't really have any money to buy lunch. But you look like, you, you know, on your profile, you have like your stylist for ID magazine. That isn't necessarily what the dream should be about. The dream should be about being able to live and breathe the scene, work within it, and it pay you a decent amount, you know, in terms of wage where you can, you know, have a roof over your head and go on a couple of holidays a year. It's not to just to look and front like your stylist carrying those massive IKEA bags full of clothing, but you have no money to pay rent. I mean, that isn't the move. Right. So I'm trying to put this atelier together and um, I'm tweeting at Mark Zuckerberg. Hey, I'm in debt. I'm just triple title. Adidas is up. We're doing this. Mark, I heard you're looking for aliens. It's an alien right here. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> Season four, we start 45 minutes late. Now, season three killed them. MSG, a thousand people. We dropped the album. Young Thug is on the stage. Or Travis Scott is jumping up. Virgil's standing right there. Everybody, 50 Cent and Jay-Z, everyone's in, a, in the audience. Season four, we start 45 minutes late. Oh, it got to be LeBron James territory right there. Like when LeBron said, I'm going to the heat, they were like, boy, you was late. <laughs> Then a week later, my wife got robbed. Then a week later, I was tired and ended up in the hospital. Then a year after that, Bernard Arnault could have picked anybody he wanted to be the head of Louis Vuitton. And who was it? And as I got on that flight, I knew I had to go. Because if I didn't go and give Virgil that hug, who was I then? And that explains a lot now. That explains a lot about Kanye's um recent actions i've always kind of maintained that a lot of the breakdown happened you know as soon as a lot of the breakdown was kind of um caused maybe partly by obama's comments right when he said he's a jackass remember that comment in passing i think they picked up on a mic when obama didn't know he's been recorded and he mentioned something about oh, something someone mentioned something about kanye do something crazy and he's like oh that guy's a jackass right so Obama didn't have anything really to say about Kanye. And I think ever since then, Kanye has kind of been questioning himself and everything around him, right? He's been on a bit of a tear. Uh, relationship with Jay-Z obviously deteriorated. The stuff with Drake is obviously ongoing. And this in general has been a bit fraught. It's been an up and down contest. And of course, if you're Kanye West and you, I think probably secretively and probably maybe public, publicly, would he would probably say he's probably 10 times the designer Virgil is for 
for that spot at Louis Vuitton that you thought you were going to get, that you were destined to get, calling yourself the Louis Vuitton Don, collaborating on the Louis Vuitton sneakers, eventually grinding down Bernard Arnault to give you a deal with LVMH and then for it to fall through last minute. And then for a year later, it be given to your protege or for your assistant or for your creative director. It can be a hard pill to swallow. And, it, and I think most people, most people get jealous. You know, most people get, I, mean, I remember when I used to work at Dr. Martin's, right? And um, there was a, we had, um, we, they, we they put us, yeah, we, I worked at Dr. Martin's and it was an occasion where the supervisor role came available, right? And this was at a time when, you know, I was working in retail, my head was all in retail. And for some reason, I put the supervisor role way up on the fucking pedestal. And so did my other colleague who I was kind of coming up against it. So because we put it up against, because we put it up on such a pedestal, um, when really, in, in effect, the only benefit was that you were getting paid a pound extra an hour than your regular full-time salary. And you got the added pressure of having the keys, being a key holder, and also having to do the rotor, and also having to be the, you know, um, the in-house psychologist for all your colleagues' problems, right? You had to constantly be putting out fires and you know personally managing relationships and making sure people didn't rip each other apart, right? So that was the that was basically the gift that you got given for being a supervisor. But I remember at that time, um, we were both going for the same job, and the other guy got really annoyed and really pissed off about me getting it, right? To the point where he essentially quit and stopped talking to me for a while. So imagine that's a very you know minute, um, insignificant bullshit reason to not be friends with somebody right because you know you're jealous that they got a job that you wanted it's not even a job that anyone gives a shit about nowadays right so imagine how how much it would hurt if it was you know nowadays in your adult years and you're trying to make us trying to make a mark in a creative world which is already fraught with politics like it's politics and loads of you know barriers and obstacles that you need to overcome societally social um, um what you call it racially economically loads of things that you have to navigate through that are not you know um available or knowledge or not everyday knowledge that people will be aware of and then suddenly you get put in a position where you're pitted against somebody who was you know once your creative collaborator it can be very hard to deal with and again it can explain why he's so he's so like you know traumatized or in this weird moment that he's in now i think it's been helped a little bit so far I think Kanye would be in a far worse position if Yeezy didn't pick off, if Yeezy didn't pick up. If somehow the Trump support affected his Yeezy sales and Yeezy was kind of struggling to make any money, I think we'd see a far worse version of Kanye. I think the thing that gives Kanye solace is that even though people say what they want to say about him and quote unquote try and cancel him, the numbers don't lie, right? People still buy his trainers, people still go and attend his shows, uh, people still come out to see him at Sunday service, he still sells tons of merch. So all the bits that he kind of values, whether it comes in terms of commerce, in terms of creativity, in terms of, um, yeah, creativity and idea exploration, people are so receptive to it, right? They want to see his shows. They want to see his stage designs. They're receptive to see how he sonically puts together an album. Like, people are curious about him still. So I think that kind of puts him in a position where he's able to be like, okay, cool. I didn't get that job, but at least I've still got this thing. Because I dread to think what would have happened if he would have, because it couldn't, that, could, that explains everything, right? He loses, he, he finally grinds down LVMH to get a deal. They decide, yes, we're going to give you a deal and we're going to enlist the help of Stefano Pilati, right? And fucking, you know, legendary designer, formerly of YSL, who's now got his own brand, right? Random Identities. We're going to get you alongside Heike Aikerman, who Kanye is a big fan of Heike Aikerman, right? He's always wearing his bomber jackets and trousers and hoodies. And just in general, he's, he's, you know, he's somebody that a lot of people in that scene, a lot of people within Kanye's circle have a lot of love for and appreciation for. He's able to, his ability to kind of, you know, um, sprinkle his uh, chic powder on kind of really mundane items. To have those three people heading up a Yeezy brand backed by LVMH, it was bound to be a, a fucking, you know, a killer success. So for that to be kind of pulled under from under your feet and then for a year later for your wife to get robbed, by allegedly by one of the most notorious uh crime gangs or crime syndicates in the world in the pink panthers right they went in jewelry heist tied his wife up um and took everything that they own or they love in terms of jewelry so much so it completely changed how they conduct themselves now right they don't have any expensive items in their house no expensive paintings no expensive jewelry everything is very um um kind of low brow no kind of you know um, need to know sort of like you know re replica some of it's replica items I'm sure they have in the household because they don't want to have the real thing there. But most of it is they invest in furniture. They don't wear, you know, crazy amounts of jewelry unless they're going to particular events. And sometimes it's even costume jewelry. I think Kanye's claims have really confessed that they operate with, you know, Navy SEAL level um, of security around them in order to make sure they're not in situation again. 
those situations kind of defined what happened later on. Then he, then he goes into the crazy house and comes out and he kind of loves with Trump. But you can see why it led up to that kind of experience. You can see why. Because I think most people, even the everyday people in the scene, if they were in a situation where their best friend got the job that they wanted, you know, they would probably do worse than what Kanye's doing at the moment. But I honestly think the saving grace for his sanity and for our collective sanity is that Yeezy is still successful nowadays. Um, I think if that would have flopped off the back of his successful of, of his endorsement for Trump, we would have seen a far worse Kanye. Honestly, a far worse. But I really recommend you check out the interview. It's a very insightful interview. Um, Stephen Smith talks really glowingly as well about his interaction with Kanye, about how Kanye changed his life. I think he quit um, New Balance out the blue because he felt as if they were going in the wrong direction. And then suddenly he wasn't sure what he was going to do. And then suddenly a call from Kanye comes out of the blue. And, you know, serendipity, you know how those things work out. It's amazing. You make one leap in one way and then you know, someone offers you their hand and pulled him from out of a dark place. Um, so you see how much, you know, Kanye's impacted his life. And just in general, you see how, how much love and how much enthusiasm Kanye has for this path of his life he's in. I don't think we're ever going to get sonically or musically what we once were expecting from Kanye from back in the day. I think now his best work is going to be put in design. So I think if you want to support Kanye and you still love his vision, you love what he does, the best way to do it is probably invest or support him in his design, in his clothing, in his shoes, and whether it comes in the, the terms of housing he's going to be putting through in the future. Those are going to be a place to really, um, to really get the best of Kanye um, creative output. Um, also, another good point on the interview was that they're going to bring the manufacturing of the Yeezy 700s back into the US, which is really, really interesting to see how that kind of rolls out. And just in general, it's a really good talk about how his business is scaled up, valuations, the fact that he gave Forbes uh, a receipt of eight, a receipt showing that he had eight hundred and eight hundred and ninety million in the bank or something like that. So close to a billionaire. Um, just in general, just a really cool interview. I really want you to check it out. This is probably the best of the run of interviews he has so far which is no surprise because, again, he's, he's in front of a crowd that are very receptive to his uh, creative talents and stuff and are able to put his endorsement of Trump to one side. But, again, very interesting, very entertaining, uh, very enlightening interview. I'll put it in the show for you guys to check out. But, yeah, it's there. The headline uh, is called um, Kanye West Uncensored and Uncut by the first company. But I'll put a link in the show for you guys to see yourself. Next on the list, what do we have here? Da, 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 da. What else do we have? What else do we have here? DJ, Olivia Mage. We have brand sponsorship. Olivia Kim. What else do we have here? I mean, that might be it, you know? That might be an hour, yeah. Let's, let's do it there. That's an hour of the Exxon Zinger show. I'll come back on the other side for another episode of the show. Um, if you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five star review if people can help, so people can find the show. You know, it helps a long way to people to get up in the review. People might check it out. Maybe leave me a little, a little, a little review too. It'll be nice if you were watching via the YouTube app. Leave me a thumbs up, subscribe if you want. That'll be nice. You can check back to the other videos, and I'll see you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show. Until then, take care. Be safe. Bye.